Hi, my name is Susan Tabert, and I'm here to talk to you for the ABCD Repro NIM program about the ABCD Neurocognitive Assessments. And the goals of this presentation are to tell you a little bit about what ABCD's neurocognitive goals and objectives are, to summarize the kinds of measures that we use in the ABCD neurocognition battery, and then to review with you some of the methodological considerations that you might bear in mind as you're analyzing these neurocognitive data in ABCD. So the goals of ABCD in terms of our neuro cognition data or neuropsychological data are to examine typical changes in development over time and then also to capture altered trajectories that might be due to substance use, emergent mental health concerns, uh, traumatic brain injury, trauma, or other kind of factors that can come into play during adolescence and see if that brings about a change in the course of typical development in these various neurocognitive factors. As such, most of the tasks that we give in ABCD for cognition are repeatable tasks, things that we can give at multiple points in time to kind of chart a trajectory and then to see if there's changes in that trajectory over time. And I'll talk to you a little bit later about some of the implications that has um, methodologically. There's also a few less traditional assessments that we include in the battery at a few points in time, maybe just at a single point in time. These might be measures of what's known as sort of hot cognition or tasks that have a sort of aha moment that's discovered that you can't really repeat. So we do incorporate some of those unique kind of tasks here and there. Overall, the tasks we've suggested for use in ABCD are those that can, first of all, help us facilitate comparisons with other large studies. So common tasks, such as the NIH toolbox, which is used worldwide in many, many studies of development and other things. We also need to make sure that we maintain sensitivity to the entire developmental age that we're looking at. In ABCD, participants enter the study at age 9 to 10, and then we're going to follow them for at least 10 years. So we need to make sure that when they're kind of a young school age person at 9 to 10, that the tasks that we're giving are things they can do at that relatively early age. And also that 10 years later, they'll, the task will still be sensitive enough to detect uh, fluctuations and uh, performance. We certainly don't want something where, you know, by age 20, everyone is getting 100%. So we have to have this kind of sensitivity over a pretty broad developmental period of time. ABCD is a large study with 21 sites around the United States, and we certainly need to have computerized tasks to help with consistency and administration across multiple sites and to make the data management process more efficient. We also need tasks that the participants will relatively enjoy doing and that will minimize participant burden. So some of the tasks use item response theory so that we're not giving a ton of items of the same domain to a child during their test session. We, we really wanna make sure we're not fatiguing them or causing boredom. Here are the tasks that we give in the ABCD Neurocognitive Battery. I'm just highlighting what we give at baseline, the one-year follow-up, two-year follow-up, and three-year follow-up time points. Current and upcoming data releases just have these first three time points, but just giving you a sneak peek of what you'll have access to in about a year from the three-year follow-up data. So we have several uh, measures that could be considered general ability or intelligence kinds of tasks. These include from the NIH toolbox, picture vocabulary and oral reading recognition, uh, the kind of crystallized intelligence tasks from that battery. Those get at receptive vocabulary and uh, reading decoding skills. And then uh, at baseline, we also collected a, not a kind of language free task of um, abstraction and intellectual capability, the matrix reasoning task from the WISC-5 battery. Um, we also have a little man task. It is a task of visual spatial functioning and mental rotation that I'll show you in a bit. 
and then a task of math ability at uh, the three year follow up and probably future time points as well. Learning and memory is a, an important domain to capture. It's so important in life, in school, to be able to learn new information and retain it. It's also something that we've seen affected in uh, adolescent substance use and in certain mental health conditions that can come on in, in adolescence. So we want to make sure we get a good baseline measure of a, of a child's ability in these areas that we can track performance in over time. Here we have two NIH toolbox tasks, list sorting working memory and picture sequence memory as well. Then we have uh, the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Task, which comes from Q Interactive. And that has a phase where you're learning new words and then you repeat them after a short delay period and then a 30 minute delay period. We have quite a few tasks that capture aspects of executive functioning and cognitive control. So uh, some of these are coming from NIH Toolbox, the dimensional card sort task, pattern comparison processing speed, the flanker inhibition control and attention task. And then we have worked with a, a company called Millisecond that has a product called Inquisit that is um, quite good at administering tasks through an iPad or a smartphone. And here we've been able to work with them to develop and refine versions of tasks for ABCD. We have a task uh, called the Emotional Stroop task, which gets at inhibitory functions, but also has an emotional component that I'll explain in a bit. We use a game of dice task, which is a risky decision-making task. And then, you know, we are a neuroimaging study in ABCD, so there's three fMRI tasks that we give in ABCD while we're imaging the child's brain. These three tasks we also collect performance data on, so we can kind of consider these neurocognitive tasks as well. We use E-prime in ABCD to deliver these tasks. So this is, we have a stop signal task as one of our fMRI tasks. It's an inhibitory task. We have an emotional end back task, which gets at not only working memory, but kind of some emotion um, reactivity and regulation. Then there's several different tasks which capture reward-related behavior. We have a social influence task uh, that we uh, give through the millisecond platform. This has the young person rate risk situations, and then it lets them know how other kids their age rate it, and then we ask them to rate it again. And so we can see how much their rating is swayed by the peer uh, rating. We give uh, two very similar tasks at earliest on. We gave a, a cash choice task and then a delayed discounting task where we're um, asking them to rate, uh, you know, do you want a lot of money now or a lot of money later and various permutations of that to look at their discounting of proximal and distal rewards. And then another fMRI task where we collect behavior as well is the monetary incentive delay task that looks at reward processing and motivation. Um, Wes Thompson, our exceptional statistician in um, ABCD, who really leads our biostatistical efforts, conducted a principal components analysis of the baseline ABCD neurocognitive battery. And this showed three broad components. First of all, uh, the test kind of loaded, some loaded onto a general ability or intelligence kind of a factor. This included the picture vocabulary and oral reading recognition tasks from NIH toolbox and the little man task, that's that mental rotation task. We had a few others that loaded onto an executive functioning or cognitive control kind of a factor, and this included the uh, NIH Toolbox flanker task, the Toolbox's dimensional change card sorting task, and the Toolbox's pattern comparison processing speed task. And then finally, we had a third factor where some uh, measures loaded on kind of more of a learning and memory factor, and that included Toolbox's list sorting working memory task, its picture sequence memory task, and, and then the Ray auditory verbal learning test, several of the variables that come from that. 
There's some additional measures, of course, that we give in ABCD and uh, the neurocognitive domain that weren't included in this PCA. So we look forward to running models at our future time points as those time points progress. So I just wanted to highlight to you the longitudinal nature of what we're doing here in ABCD with these neurocognitive tasks. So time is uh, going by and each year we convene as a neurocognitive work group to determine what would be the best kinds of tasks to include in each year's protocol. We want to repeat tasks as much as possible so we can carefully track changes over time in normal development and look at features that may cause changes to that normal development. We also, uh, the broad design of ABCD includes neuroimaging at baseline two year, and then it'll be the four, six, eight, and so on, the even years. So there's certain tasks that we want to look at in close conjunction with the neuroimaging data. And then at the other time points, we see the kids for a little bit of a shorter time. There's a few measures that we capture here as well. We have less time then, and um, these measures are those that don't need to necessarily be as in close a sync with the imaging data. This approach helps us to cover multiple domains and include not only longitudinal measures over time, but a few measures of hot cognition. And we really try to minimize participant burden by not including all of the tasks all of the time. So now I'll review the tasks in this battery in a little bit more detail. So uh, the NIH toolbox cognition domain includes a comprehensive set of neurocognitive tasks. Uh, it includes measures of language, attention, episodic memory, working memory, executive functioning, and processing speed. It was originally developed for the web, but then later adapted for iPad-based administration. That's what we use typically in ABCD. Uh, NIH Toolbox's cognition domain was developed to facilitate longitudinal measurements of cognition over time from ages three through the lifespan. T we give uh, all seven tasks in ABCD and it takes about 35 minutes on average to administer these tasks. It provides a number of scores then that we can get from NIH Toolbox. Raw scores, um, age standardized scores, and demographically corrected T-scores. We are also able to get item level raw data and we can make those scores available, but typically analyses are looking at these summary scores, these kind of raw totals, age standardized, demographically corrected T-scores <laughs> as summary scores for each task. Healthmeasures.net, you can get more information about NIH toolbox. Some of our tasks are um, coming from Q Interactive, and uh, these are <clears throat> the uh, Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Task, and this um, is, is given through the iPad through Q Interactive, which is made by Pearson. The Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Task gives you a set of words to remember and then you're asked to recall the words after five learning trials. An alternate or distractor word list is presented. You're asked to learn that and then provide the original word list. And then after a delay period, you're asked to provide the word list again. There are alternate word lists provided that are matched over time and difficulty level so that we can look at performance in this area over uh, time, over development takes about 16 minutes on average to administer and within that there's a 30 minute delay period where we can do some other tasks. We really try to not have any um, verbal activities occur during that 30 minute delay period. We don't want to introduce any additional um, words or verbal kind of interference. And then we get from uh, Q Interactive performance and different kinds of errors on these learning and recall trials for the RA-BLT. 
At the baseline time point, we also gave uh, Q Interactive's matrix reasoning task, which comes from the WISC-5. It was about eight minutes to administer and it provides raw and standardized scores. And here's some references for how you can get more information on Pearson's assessments, including these, and more details on these tasks. This is the little man task. Uh, in the feedback that we collect on the kids in the study, a lot of kids said this was their favorite task, and a few kids said that it was their least favorite task. It's pretty challenging. This is a task of mental rotation that takes about six minutes on average to administer. It is pretty engaging, and it was developed for ABCD by the millisecond um, folks using their inquisit platform and extensive expertise from our ABCD colleagues, Dr. Sarah Jo Nixon and Robert Prather at University of Florida. And from this, uh, from the trials in this task, we get measures of accuracy and reaction time. The task says the little man on the screen has an object in one of his hands. Is it in his right hand or his left hand? And you see different across the trials, the, the man facing you or the back of his head and he's maybe upside down or sideways or right side up and then you need to figure out is that little briefcase in his left hand or his right hand. It is not easy. Because ABC, well, ABCD looks at many things. One thing that we are interested in is people's um, rewards and their risk for substance use problems down the line. And features such as uh, delay discounting have been shown in other studies to be important predictors of substance use um, problems. So this is some uh, kind of task that we've given at quite a few time points. So at the baseline time point, we give a very brief single item cash choice question. Let's pretend a kind person wanted to give you some money. Would you rather have $75 in three days or $115 in three months? And uh, these questions were kind of calibrated based on other research and uh, uh, give us a little bit of a, of, an, of a sense of kids delay discounting at that early time point. Then starting at the one year follow-up and three year follow-up and, and every two years thereafter, we give a fuller delay discounting task. It's about three minutes developed for ABCD by, in, by millisecond using their inquisitive platform. And it provides indifference points for seven different kinds of delays tested as well as reaction times. Um, what we're typically the most interested in is their preferred choice. And here's a sample question. Press in your preferred choice, get $50 now or get $80 in one month. And here's some more information about the task. Other studies are welcome to use this task as well as the other tasks that were developed for ABCD through Millisecond's test library. And this task is developed based on work from Warren Bickle and colleagues. We have an emotional stroop task. It's about nine minutes to administer. Also developed for ABCD by millisecond and you can access and use the task uh, here. And uh, the idea here is that you categorize words that show up on the screen. So for example, in this case, the word happy. So you categorize the word as being good or bad kinds of a feelings. But at the same time, the screen is showing either a word congruent or a word incongruent emotion face. So this young fella here, he has a, you know, incongruent uh, facial expression. He does not look happy. And so that is just as an interference, as a Stroop kind of interference um, effect. But the rating that you give is based on the word. So typically you would respond with a good. Although there is variability in how kids perform in the task in that presence of the face does elicit uh, some um, need for inhibition and some responses that, that aren't always correct. There's two blocks within the task and some of the blocks, 25% um, of, the, of the trials are incongruent between the word and the face and most of them are congruent. So it makes it a little bit of an oddball that they're incongruent. And then some of the blocks, it's 50-50 as to if the word and the face are congruent or not on their affective pairings. Millisecond provides us then with accuracy and reaction time for each condition and each block of this task. And our expert uh, in ABCD is Marie Banich, uh, who's done a lot of work with emotional stroop kinds of tasks and helped us really perfect this for use in ABCD. 
We use a game of dice task in ABCD. It was uh, developed, it was already available on a millisecond. And so we just adapted it slightly and you can access the task for yourself in your own studies. It's about six minutes and it's a measure of inhibition and risky decision-making. Provides quite a few variables, including the number of safe versus risky choices, the wins, the losses, and the overall monetary value that come from these kinds of um, risk-taking choices versus safer kinds of choices in picking the numbers. And we have a social influence task, which was developed for uh, by ABCD investigators, uh, primarily Dr. Bonnie Nagel at Oregon Health and Science University. We used millisecond to administer it, and it was based on the work of Dr. Sarah Jane Blakemore and colleagues. It assesses social influence and risk taking. And uh, so first of all, we have the youth rate a risk item. Some of them are very low risk, and it escalates into some other items that are higher risk. So the youth rates how risky a particular item is, going out in the cold with wet hair. And then you get a screen that says people your age rated this item as such, and then you're asked to rate it again. And in general, we see that at this baseline, I'm sorry, at this two-year follow-up time point, when kids are about 11 and 12 years of age, they do tend to alter their ratings based on um, their uh, uh, information about how people their age group rate the items. And that's something that we're interested in, this kind of pull of your own ratings based on your perception of peer ratings. Um, and uh, millisecond provides us with the youth's risk rating, so we can look just at that in and of itself, their initial rating. And then we can also look at their socially influenced change in their risk rating, basically the rating between their, their second and their first rating. We also have a mental arithmetic task. It's the Stanford Mental Arithmetic Response Time Evaluation Task. This was developed by our um, consultant and colleague in ABCD, Dr. Bruce McCandless at Stanford. It's about seven minutes. We use the Inquisit platform here, and there's several components to the task. First of all, math enumeration. So this is just sort of dot counting. You just uh, type in the number of dots that you see, so there's eight. And then comes math questions. So um, math fluency and math recall. Basically, these conditions provide a number of a single and double digit arithmetic and subtraction problems for the youth to quickly compute. And we look to see how many questions they can complete in a given point in time, a given amount of time, that is. At the end, we give a single math anxiety item because we know that some kids have a little bit of anxiety when it comes to math. And so we ask kind of how nervous they would feel if they were about to take a math task in school. So those are the measures that we give so far in ABCD for neurocognition. And next I wanna talk with you a little bit about some methodological considerations that might be important for you to keep in mind as you analyze these data. <clears throat> First of all, neurocognitive data is subject to how well it was administered. So it's very important that um, Participants are given the tasks in a uniform manner across sites and over time from year to year. So good training is really important to make sure that the data are valid. And there's a couple of steps that we take in ABCD to make sure that we have good consistency in how the tasks are administered. First of all, we have uh, annual site visits from ABCD's coordinating center to each of the 21 sites to observe staff giving the tasks and to provide feedback, make sure this is being done consistently. Um, and we have pretty extensive feedback that we give about, uh, about this process. In addition, we have weekly all-site RA meetings through Zoom where uh, new information and tips are given, Train, detailed trainings are given in this manner on uh, when we roll out new tasks for new time points. And then we have detailed annual train the trainer meetings, typically in person when there isn't a pandemic. 
And that's when we go into great detail on training the trainer, the main coordinator at each site on how the tasks are given so that person can go back to their site and train everybody uh, on how to uh, practice giving the task and then how to actually give it. We create detailed standard operating procedures for each protocol element, and these are available on, we use uh, Confluence as sort of our web platform where we store all of these standard operating procedures and make them available to all ABCD staff and investigators. And we have an ABCD neurocognition work group, which is critical to uh, developing these tasks, addressing issues and how they should best be used in ABCD, and then that also evaluates the data, the incoming data for irregularities, for differences between sites, uh, for any kinds of concerning patterns so that we can address those very quickly. I should also mention that uh, we give a vision task, um, the Snellen vision, vision test for kids who come into the study so we can check their, their vision and also handedness is assessed. So you might want to take a look at the vision performance and consider excluding cases that seem to have very, very low vision from your analysis of neurocognitive uh, data. Because in ABCD, we're so keenly looking at development over time and how certain environmental exposures and other factors might change that developmental trajectory. We have repeated measures and therefore we need to look at practice effects. It's a challenge for any longitudinal study where you're repeating cognitive tasks. And there's a couple of ways that we uh, can address this and kind of look at this in ABCD. The, the first of all is that we use alternate forms of the task with the greatest practice effects. So tasks in general that tend to show the greatest effect of having been tested before are tasks of verbal learning and memory. And it's always possible that some participants might gain from that prior experience more so than others. So that's why, you know, this is something that's important to consider. It's also the possibility that, you know, over time, although we have tasks that we give, say, at the baseline, at the two-year follow-up, the four-year follow-up, the six-year follow-up, it would be great if all participants by the six year follow up have been present for all the prior testing points, but we know that won't be the case. Maybe there's somebody at the six year follow up who's missed two prior testing occasions. And so they haven't had the same amount of experience with the tasks and wouldn't have as much practice effect. And that could potentially influence their scores, their performance on the task. So a couple of ways that we can examine and, and model practice effects is, um, you know, there are about, uh, you know, 1% and, and maybe more over time of, of participants who, who missed the task at the prior time point versus those who did have it. So we can compare these, say if we're missing, you know, 1% of people at a given point in time, we can compare their performance to the person who had it at that prior point in time to say, you know, gosh, there's 1% of the variability or 3% of the variability that's affected by having had the task the last time in the protocol it was administered. Uh, we'd of course want to compare those groups, you know, control for demographic factors as well, um, but that might be helpful. And this might help estimate the extent to which that prior testing influences subsequent performance. There's also a little bit of overlapping assessments in terms of the age. So for people are age uh, nine to 10 when they entered ABCD, and that duration of enrollment spanned about two years, about 26 months in time. So we can get kind of a little bit of overlap here where we have, you know, the very youngest subjects who came in at having just turned nine, but then at their two year follow up, they're just about 11. And then the people who were the oldest subjects were almost 11 at their baseline. So we can kind of compare, match them on age, but this person would have done the task twice, whereas this person would have done the task just one time, right? If we're looking at their two year follow up performance versus this person's baseline performance. Um, and that might help us kind of tease out some of the differences between development and the effects of repeated testing. 
A couple of other important methodological considerations, uh, given that I'm telling you this in the year 2020. So what I've described to you so far is how we administer the tasks in person. Um, typically in ABCD, we're giving all the tasks in person. The youth comes to the research site with their parents and does the tasks with a trained RA pretty much via an iPad. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began in March, most all of our sites stopped seeing participants in person for, um, to prevent community spread. And ABCD worked very quickly to develop remote administration versions of these tasks. Some of the tasks are just oral anyway, and so they're relatively easy to do um, remotely. You just need for the person, the subject, to have a good connection to you, a good either Zoom or phone connection, and they need to have a relatively quiet place in their home where they can go to for that assessment. A lot of our families in ABCD don't have a good computer or a iPad, so we thought we should create remote administration on the most common platform that the largest number of families have, which is a smartphone. And so we ad ad adapted a lot of our tasks for administration on a smartphone so that the largest number of ABCD participants could take the task in that manner and across a consistent platform. So starting in March of 2020, our three-year follow-ups, which included just three millisecond administered tasks were all adapted and made available for remote administration. I think by the first week of April, we were able to start um, training and letting that happen that way. Uh, and then starting in July 2020, and until we don't know when yet, uh, we have made modifications to the two-year follow-up, that's a more extensive battery, for administration remotely or with a modified in-person protocol. So for most kids, you know, we want to keep everybody safe. So they're in their home. The RAs of ABCD are working from their own homes and they're administering these tasks in a manner as similar as possible as to what we would do if we were in person. There's a task that we can't do remotely. It's the pattern comparison processing speed. Those are really hard tasks to do remotely. We don't have the Snellen vision test uh, in a remote capacity. And um, the main difference, of course, though, is for most of the tasks, the youth or parent's smartphone is what is used instead of an iPad. There's also uh, the, the NIH toolbox version of the flanker task can't be done remotely. So millisecond has a version of a flanker task that we give instead. So these are just some important considerations as you're looking at the ABCD neurocognitive data over time that this period of the pandemic, you will see some different variables, a couple of different tasks, a little bit of missing data, but some stuff that is there, the same variables are being collected. There are variables that indicate the method of the data collection. So if it was remote or in person, and you will want to control for that because there are some differences. We've started to look at the data for subjects who were assessed with these tasks uh, in the old fashioned in person way versus in the pandem pandemic era uh, remote way. And there is a lot of consistency, but for tasks of reaction time or tasks where it really requires a lot of very focused attention, there's a little bit more variability. So it's just something that I think is important to control for in your analyses. And then just as a uh, FYI, so there are some kids in the ABCD study who really don't have very good equipment at home and it really wasn't possible for them to be tested with um, a smartphone or for them to have a place at home where it was quiet. So for some of those kids, we did the testing on site, but in a way that was very pandemic friendly by having the participant and the RA in separate rooms talking through ABCD equipment, talking through ABCD cell phones, and the youth is completing the, the um, assessment through an iPad in that manner. Okay, so just to summarize, 
of the ABCD neurocognition battery. It was designed to examine typical development and altered trajectories due to environmental, genetic, or other factors that might be of interest to you or to other scientists. The tasks cover kind of the general realms of general ability, intelligence, learning and memory, executive functioning or cognitive control, and reward. And methodological considerations for you when you analyze the data, um, there are highly trained staff who give the tasks and regular checks for consistency. There are remote administration uh, versions that were created for the COVID-19 pandemic, and this will probably continue to be used post-pandemic. Hopefully we'll get there. For participants who say move far away, maybe they move to Brazil, or Japan, where we're not able to assess them in person, but we can still capture some data on their performance through these methods that we've developed for the pandemic. Mode of administration is available in the data releases and, and should be uh, controlled for. The pandemic data won't be in the end of 3.0 release, but it will be in the end of 4.0 release. And so you'll want to figure out what are the specific variables there and make sure to control for those in your model and maybe compare pandemic versus non-pandemic era performance uh, before you proceed with your um, own hypotheses. I want to thank the neurocognitive work group of ABCD who really make this possible as well as the RAs at all of the sites and the site monitors of the coordinating center who are Vanessa Diaz and Clarissa Coronado. The work group chairs of the neurocognitive work group are Monica Luciana of the University of Minnesota and Jim Bjork of Virginia Commonwealth University. The members of the work group have had a very exceptional neuropsychologist with really great ideas and good thinking listed here. We have some outstanding postdocs who are part of the group who've done a lot of the data analysis and some very important consulting members as well, Chris Lizdahl and Bruce McCandless. Uh, thank you very much for your time and I hope you have found this to be helpful.